Thank you so much for being here today. I want to give a disclaimer before we jump into the Bible, a little disclaimer. I have a hole in my sweater. <laughs> my wife, if you've not met her, is a real human. She came up and said, my God, honey, you have a hole in your sweater. And I'm like, thanks, Holy Ghost, like I didn't know. She said, please tell them that I was asleep when you left the house. I can't believe you left the house that way. I said back, as a husband would, you really think I woke up and thought, let me wear a sweater with a hole in it? She goes, well, I never know what you're thinking. But I put it on thinking I looked handsome in blue. It made me look thinner because that's what she tells me. Don't wear stripes. You look thinner. And I got here, and the hole, it was so anointed first service, it's gotten bigger. So, so if my breasts start hanging out in the middle of my message, it's non-intentional. But keeping my sweater on is a better option than the alternative. So I'm going to stay with it and just bear with me. If you feel sorry for me, uh, I'll go shopping with you, and we can buy a new sweater. But... Uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, my mother's like, I'll buy you one. <laughs> Bless his heart. Phil feels like, would well, you want to swap? I'm like, swap? Look at what you're wearing. No, I don't want to. <laughs> I'd look like a pillowcase. No, I, that's why I wear black. Supernatural nonsense. I, for several weeks, have been praying about a new series called Adam. And I told Phil, I said, every time I go to study it, to uh, I have it in my head, but to, when I say study it, put it out where it's manageable. I, I just feel like, ah, not yet. And I hold on to it. And I've been doing that for several weeks. And last week I was not here, and my sweet bride and Ryan Holdeman spoke. Would you give them a hand for speaking? They did a great job, thanks to both of them. So I came home this week thinking, uh, all right, we're going to do Adam. And I sat down and began to wrestle with it. And it just never would like, I couldn't get the freedom to do it. And I landed on this, popped in my heart, what's on the TV, supernatural nonsense. That phrase rose up in my heart and I perceive it to be something our church needs to hear. And so I began to pray it out and put it together, put my thoughts together. And I pray, I don't pray, I know, because I know what the Lord put in my heart, that it's going to inspire you today and, and challenge your faith at the same time and take you to another level of potential living with Jesus that is going to cause your life to step into a place and a season with God, and I believe it will help you. The phrase is very intentional. It comes from some scripture, we're going to go to four places, Corinthians, then the book of Kings, then the Gospels, and then back to Corinthians. Paul writes a letter, and in his letter, you know, you don't write chapters and verses in letters, but it's pretty important because it shows up in chapter 1, what we would call 19 verses in, but obviously we would say it's at the top of his letter, so when he wrote this letter to this church, it was fairly important, obviously. And this is what Paul says. As the Scriptures say, verse 19 of 1 Corinthians 1, As the Scriptures say, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and discard the intelligence of the intelligent. So where does this leave philosophers, scholars, and the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. So when we preach that Christ was crucified, here's where it starts getting very interesting. The Jews, I don't know if there's many Jewish people here today, but it says those people are offended. But then it picks up the rest of every human on the planet and calls us Gentiles. So this is everyone else in the room today. He says the Gentiles just say it's nonsense. And what it lends me to believe is that even Paul, several years removed, not 2,000, but just several years, maybe a decade removed from Jesus' resurrection 2,000 years ago, Paul is already bumping up into a mindset that says this Jesus thing is just nonsense. It doesn't even make sense. The whole God thing, heaven thing, the whole God dies for humans and all the 
prerequisites of what that even entails in our perceptions. He says, and he doesn't even make apology, he just matter-of-factly says it's just nonsense. And so when I read that, it, it pricked my thinking that I wonder if we're in a generation today where everything we call God, church, religion is just nonsense. It's, it's just a preacher, a sermon, an offering, a, a check box that you can check off and go, I went to church today, I feel better about myself. It's not something that's new if you've ever questioned, is it real? If you're sitting here today having the thought, I wonder if it's real. I wonder if Jesus is real. Uh, or is this thing called church necessary? Do I really need church in my life? Do I need this thing we call community? Can't I do life without it? Where is God? If God is so good, why me? I don't understand why I'm going through the pain I'm going through. Why am I going through the suffering that I'm going through? Why did all this hell hit me? Like if you're trying to figure it out and it doesn't make sense to us, the, the reality of God, and I'll throw this to all of us because I, I think it is a, an interesting thought. If God made sense to us, would He be God? Because if I could dumb him down to my understanding, he probably really would not be God. If I could figure him out. So there is an essence to his godness that is so far beyond our humanity that Paul says, if you start talking about God, if you start talking about Christ, there's going to be an issue in our mentalities that it will seem like nonsense. Why pray to the sky? What if nothing's up there? All the things that we religious people do, our giving of our offerings, our taking of communion, it just seems like nonsense. Well, he goes on to say this. He said, but to those that are called by God to salvation, and he lumps us both together, the people that are offended and the people that think it's nonsense. Both of these groups of people, he said, let me simplify it for you. Christ is the power of and He's the wisdom of God. Now in that moment, something interesting happens that pertains to every human in the room today. Because all of us are looking for fruit or reality. We want, if God is, then I need to see some reality. If you tell me He's a healer, I need to see some healing. If you tell me He's a blesser, I need to see some blessings. If you tell me, preacher, if I tithe, then I need to see some fruit. If you tell me, so everybody in the room, God or no God, the way we maintain our reality is, is I need to see evidence. I, I want to know that prayer won't just tell me to pray. I need to see some evidence to it. So he comes in and says, now here, if you humans, now notice he did this. He said, some of you are offended. Some of you think it's nonsense, but I want to, I want to, Simplify it for, for the Corinthians. He said Christ is the power and He's also the wisdom. Now as a human, every human in the room, all of us, I, and I could say it without thinking I would flunk the test. Everybody in the room likes Christ the power. Because you don't need to do a thing. He just blows your mind. You didn't even deserve it. He blessed you anyway. You, you're just a raunchy, no good Low down, and he's like, I love you, going to bless you. It, it's, it's not even understanding why that person got healed because you know they didn't deserve it, and God did it for them. It's the power. Now, the reason we like power, the Christ, the power, requires nothing of us. It just blows our mind, and then the only thing required of us is to post that on Facebook. It's the only requirement. I'm going to blow your mind. All I need you to do is cop me a little bit of ego on Facebook, tell people what I did for you. So we're like, yes, let me tell you what he did for me. Now that feels good. Instagram it, it feels good. We can all heart it and clap and get likes. That, that Christ is the, is the how we sell this thing called Christianity. We sell this, the power of God. There is another essence to him that cuts to the quick. And it's Christ, the wisdom of God. We don't like that, that one. Because the wisdom of God requires something out of me. 
Power requires nothing. Wisdom requires things like, um, hand me your sandwich, I'm going to do something with it. It requires something like, go dip seven times in that dirty water over there. The wisdom of God requires something. March around the, the city seven times, keep your pie hole shut, don't say a thing. Could have, God, could have God blown up the city of Jericho by himself? Yes. If you're talking power of God, he could have done it. But wisdom of God is, I'm not going to do it. You're going to obey and walk around, and in my wisdom, it will be done. So sometimes wisdom is not instantaneous. It's a journey of learning to keep your mouth shut and do what he tells you to do so you will see his power. So there's an essence of God that it will, there will be times where it feels like He's doing nothing and it's not working. Because I'm so in the green, I want the power. Yet most of the Bible stories are stories of His wisdom, not just His power. His wisdom requires things out of us that we don't enjoy. Build me a boat. I don't like that. I like that I don't want to do a thing. I don't want to have to, you know, this don't require anything out of me. Let me do YOLO. You love me. You perform for me. I'll post about you. And that's what Christianity has been dumbed down to. God performing for people so we can post about Him because I don't want him to require a dabbling thing out of me because I'll suddenly realize how selfish I am and I don't want that to be. I don't want to be required to forgive somebody I don't want to forgive. I don't want to be required to do anything I don't want to do. So if we're going to talk God, we cannot separate him as a bipolar God. He's one. He's power and wisdom together. So that I could say, and I did this. God, blood pressure's a little high. I need you to heal my blood pressure. Come here and anoint me with oil. Ooh. Elders anoint me with oil. Hey, elders, I just show my blood pressure's a little high. I need blood pressure, God, to show up. Come on, blood pressure, Jesus. In other words, power, Jesus. I need power, Jesus. Now, the reason I need power, Jesus, is because I ain't giving up my donuts, but I want my blood pressure better. And I'm not going to quit eating bad, but I do want my blood pressure. So power Jesus kick in so I can keep eating bacon and, and donuts. Wisdom Jesus kicks in when I go, my blood pressure's still high, and the elders anointed me with oil, and I don't know why it ain't working. I thought prayer would work. Blood pressure's still high. And then wisdom Jesus kicks in and says, because you're fat. <laughs> Lose weight. Well, losing weight doesn't feel like power. Losing weight feels like flesh. And he's like, well, what I'm going to do is give you the wisdom to lose some weight here. And in losing weight, I got my blood pressure checked. I've lost 13 pounds. Got my blood pressure checked. Mm. It's, it's normal. But I'm not out there going, oh, he healed me. He healed me. No, he gave me the wisdom to stop eating a donut every day. And in not eating a donut every day, lo and behold... And I thought it was a devil. And it's like, no, it starts with a D. It's a donut. It's not a devil. <laughs> donut. You're blaming on devil. Not a devil. Donut. Now, I will say the reason many Christians have so much problem today is they've only been introduced to the power of Jesus and they don't like His wisdom. I don't want Him in my business. I don't want Him so that we walk up and go, hey, I just need you to pray for a marriage. Oh, it's desperate. Okay, let's pray. I hope Jesus just heal their marriage. Heal their marriage. Just touch him. Oh, he's a jerk. Just touch that little jerk. It just help him love her and fall in love with you, Jesus. And you pray. Nothing happens. She comes back. We're still terrible. Let's pray again. Come against. Let's name those demons. What are their names? I bind that demon. <laughs> Nothing changes. And finally, the wisdom of God kicks in and says, Hey, I know what. Why don't y'all go to counseling? Well, that costs something. 
I don't want it to cost something. I don't want somebody else in my business telling me what to do. I just want God. You understand what I'm saying? We love, Christians love the power of God, but we, we want to skirt His wisdom. Now in that came the title supernatural nonsense that, that when God steps in, He wants to do things, but the way He's going to do it in His wisdom rarely makes sense. He will ask things of us that won't make sense in the mind. Why would he want me to forgive somebody who hurt me? They need to forgive me. They need to, they need to ask for the apology, not me, but yet his wisdom. So I put this on here because, again, I'm talking about us, not other churches, but us. If we're not careful, I put six things up there that we do. We sing, pray, we have a community moment where that's where all the introverted people go, God, don't touch me. And then we have teaching, and then we have communion and giving. So every single week we come together, we do six things. We sing, and, and we call it church. Some people call it religion. Whatever you term it, that's, that's the stuff we do. We'll call it stuff. This, when you come in the door, is what we do. You can come in late, top three, and still catch some good teaching by me. You can slip out before the giving and keep some of your money. But here's the reality. In our thinking, it's just church and religion. I can live with it, live without it. If I had a bad Sunday or I'm tired today or I got a lot to do, or I can just check a box. Or, But if you take our thinking and you remove it, everything here is supernatural. It's not just singing. It's connecting your soul to a river of His anointing. And as you lift your voice, you're like, I don't like that song. It had Sheol in it. Okay, great. But at the end of the day, as you lift your voice up to God, you begin to make a connection in song. And here's what I know. The moment a believer begins to praise Him, all hell begins to just be bombarded because in the praise, the, the, the voice of the enemy is silenced. Something supernatural. I do know the prayer just feels like, oh God, I'm really desperate. Could you please just help me? But prayer connects you to His wisdom. Community, I know it's just hugging each other and we hope we've brushed our teeth and oh my God, here comes that person that talks too much. It's like, oh. <laughs> Jesus, please. Oh, they're still here. Oh God. Like I understand, but in reality, everybody in the room has the Holy Spirit if you're, if you're born again Christian and you have something to offer and sometimes a handshake, how are you doing? A hug around the neck is supernatural. I was talking to somebody before church and they walked, this just a minute ago, they walked up and I just did this. And she went, I already saw the hole. I was like, oh man, still love you anyway, right? Like that feels good. You love a disheveled pastor who can't even dress himself. The teaching, the communion, if you're not careful, it's just the end of the service. It's just these little packets that nobody but God can open. <laughs> and you were touched. I mean, I mean, the message touched you. You got a tear in your eye. Stand up. Well, it's time for communion. And you're still touched. And you walk up there and you get the little communion thing, the COVID-free packet, not the one with germs on it. And you, you walk back to your seat. You're still, you and God, you're still just touched. And it's like, Jesus, God Almighty. Oh, God. God Almighty. Jesus. You don't, you've lost the anointing. There, there's no God. It's just like, God Almighty, I hate these. Jesus. And your wife's looking at you like you're an idiot. And, and you can't even see the top because you're old. You're just like. And you bite your fingernails so you don't even have a finger. It's just a nub trying to get it. And so you don't even take communion. You're just like, oh, I just put it in your pocket and find it a month later. It's like, oh, I forgot that was there. That is why we have real bread and wine. Real bread and wine is for old people who can't see the other. And just go ahead and dip it in the juice. And yeah, there's probably hair in there and other things floating around. But God touches it. And once He touches the juice, you'll be okay. Just move the spit out of the way. Dunk the bread. Oh, <laughs> 
but in the mind, ooh, it's just, just, just communion, let's slip out. Oh, it's communion time, let's just go hurry. It's communion, it's just that nasty taste in bread. It's communion, oh, I don't want to look at all that juice in there and bread floating. But in God's mind, something supernatural happens when you take it. So what I would like to do is over the next several weeks in the nicest of ways, maybe with some depth and humor to walk us through, are we just a church that's supernatural or are we one of nonsense? Do these things mean anything to you at all? Or are they just part of what we call church service? And you can slip out and in anytime you want because they really are just... They're teaching. It's just a TED talk. 38 minutes, make me feel better, send me home. Or do they carry supernatural things to them? So I want to start. I'm going to start from the end, and I'm going to work my way back up. I won't do it all today, of course, but we're going to just talk about it. Because when it went off in my heart, not thinking of you, but I often start with myself and thought, okay, well, I don't want to pastor a church that it, we've lost the hunger for the supernatural. And it's just church. If I come in the door, I want to come expecting. And so a scripture had been resonating in my heart for a while, and so I turned to it. If you don't mind, if you want to turn there, it's in the book of Kings, 1 Kings. Now the story we pick up goes this way. There is a prophet that's having a battle with a king, and the prophet and king are going back and forth between God's wisdom and king's wisdom. And God tells the prophet, hey, go tell the dude it's not going to rain, and it doesn't. It doesn't rain for like three plus years. And in that three plus years, God is talking to this prophet, and he uses a bird to feed him. And, and, but at this time, where we're going to come into the story, all the water's dried up. There's no water. It's so bad that God's not even going to use the bird anymore. The bird flies off like, yeah, there's no food left to take the prophet. So God's quit using the bird. Now the prophet's in a famine and there's no water in the land. And so we come into the story at that point. And here it is in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 8. Now the Lord, that's the power of God, said to Elijah, now anytime God talks to a human, it's going to require wisdom. Because if it's just going to be God's power, He doesn't need you. He can just blow your mind without you even in the equation. But anytime He says, and the Lord said to, and you get that, whoever He's going to bring into the equation of His supernatural ability, it's going to require some wisdom. We're going to, it's going to require something out of me. So He says to the prophet, the prophet's name is Elijah, verse 9, Go and live in the village of Zarephath near the city of Sidon, I have instructed a widow to feed you there. Now this is where, in my mind, the Bible and some stories of the Bible are nonsensical to me. It's like, I don't even understand them. And I will say the Bible's meant to be that way. You're supposed to read the Bible and go, I don't get it. Because if you could get it, it would all just be the wisdom of humans. So the Bible was written in such a way you're supposed to question it because you're trying to understand it in your own thinking. So this story comes, and this is how we know it would have to be written by God because if a human wrote it, we would have never sent a desperate prophet to a widow. Because that makes me think in human wisdom, oh no man, you don't... A widow? She, she doesn't have... How is a widow going to... Come on, this isn't true. That's just so feminist. Like you're going to send a man to a woman. Like she's broken, she's hurting, and you want her to feed you? Send him to a rich person. Send him to somebody that's got some money. But God's like, you know, I got, I got something here I want to do. I'm going to blow y'all's mind because I'm going to use my wisdom to show you something I want to do, Elijah. Go to the widow. I've already instructed her to feed you. So he shows up. So he goes to Zarephath, he arrives at the gates of the village, and he sees a widow gathering sticks. I'm assuming he thought that this must be her. So he asked, would you please bring me a little water? And in reading that, and this, again, a passage that's always kind of irritated me, 
would you bring me some water? I'm thinking, bro, she's gathering sticks. She's a widow. Why don't you get your own dad blame water? Why are you, why are you making her? And if I would have written the story, Mark could have written it, raising four daughters, it would have went this way. And he saw a widow gathering sticks, and he asked her, would you please bring me the water? And the widow said no and hit him with a stick. Get your own water. <laughs> Coming to me for water? <laughs> Go get your own water, you sorry little coot. Would you, he says, bring me a little water in a cup? And as she was going to get it, as only a man could say, hey, could you bring me a little sandwich while you're in the kitchen? Could you bring me a little bite of bread too? And in reading that, I'm like, why is God doing this? Why has God taken a desperate man to a woman that has nothing? And God said, I chose the woman who has nothing to prove a kingdom wisdom to you. I could have picked anybody. I could have picked a giraffe to bring you a piece of bread. I could have had a turtle bring you some water. But I didn't choose a giraffe, nor a raven, or a bird, or a dove. Nothing. I chose a widow that has nothing. Go to her and let me work a miracle here. So he does, but, but really, it, it, in the mind of a human, it's so off-putting. Why don't you as a man help me get some sticks rather than just barking orders at me? Why don't you get your own water? She could have copped an attitude, but she did not. She said, I swear by the Lord God, I don't have a single piece of bread in my home. And I have only a handful of flour left in the jar and a little cooking oil in the bottom of the jug I was just gathering a few sticks to cook this last meal and then my son and I are going to go die. That's the woman God picked. A woman that has no hope, a woman that's given up, and a woman that says, I have nothing to offer you. I'm, I, matter of fact, I'm at wit's end. I don't even know. I don't have any other resources. I'm going to die. My kid's dying. So you would think the prophet would say, come here, honey, give me a hug. It's okay. Go, go die. <laughs> right? I'll find water somewhere. But Elijah said, don't be afraid. Go ahead and do just what you've said. And then the little arrogant cuss. However, before you die... And your kid rots away from malnutrition. Make a little bread for me first. And then whatever's left over, prepare something for you and your son. And again, it is the typical evangelist. Like, take care of me, baby. I don't care if you can't pay your bills. Give to me. So this whole weird mindset of what is God? But remember, this wasn't Elijah taking advantage of a woman this was God saying, I've instructed something in my wisdom to happen. I just need both of you to line up with my wisdom. And if you do, I'm going to blow both of your minds. But I need you to obey me and not question me. Go to the widow. And I need you to not get ticked at him that he seems like he doesn't even want to help you. Just help him and watch what I'm going to do for both of you. And so God does, and she says, For this is what the Lord said, this is the prophet. The God of Israel says, Oh, come on, somebody. There will always be flour and olive oil left in your containers until the time when the Lord sends the rain. And the story goes on to say that her vats of oil never ran dry. What was God trying to do? God was trying to get two desperate people who had no resource on their own. No water, no food, no water, no food. You're about to die, just enough to die, none. I'm going to have to take you none to just about to die, but I'm going to hook up nothing with just about to die, and I'm going to blow both of your minds with my power. But before you see my power, you must trust my wisdom. And a lot of Christians today are praying for the power, but they don't want to leave and go to Zarephath. 
They want God to keep sending them a bird. And God's like, dude, bird is over. I need you to suck it up and go here. But I don't want to walk anywhere. (laughs) This is too far. It's too hot. I don't have any water. And then to the woman, look, honey, I know you're about to die. There's coming a dude. Listen, when he comes, he's going to seem arrogant. He's a prophet. But what I need is whatever he asks of you, do it. Hey, I've instructed this chick that when you get there, she's going to feed you. You clear? You clear. Both of you trust me? All right, and action. Okay, all right, here he comes. Oh, this is good. Are y'all watching this? Hey, get some of the angels. Oh, oh, here he comes. He's about to, oh, he's, he's got her. He got her. He found her. He found her. Oh, are y'all seeing this? Oh, God. Oh, geez. He's, he just asked her for some water. He didn't even offer to help her with sticks. He's such a, oh, oh there it goes. Oh, she, she's getting him some water. No. Oh, God. He just told her, give him a sandwich. What did he ask? I didn't want him to ask for a sandwich. What did he ask for a sandwich? You understand what I'm saying? But as he's watching it, all of a sudden, he's like, they did it. Hey, saddle up the horses, boys. We got a trail to blaze. We got some power to bring out. Bring on all of the angels of heaven. And all of a sudden, every angel of heaven is commissioned to this little widow woman. And her barrels just start overflowing with oil. And she never, ever, 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 according to the story, lacks one thing again. What? Because if I had written this story... I wouldn't have done it that way. I wouldn't have done it to where I would have just prayed a special prayer over her to be blessed as she dies. To spare her child. But the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God to give. Because here's the thought of the matter. Is that the wisdom of the Lord, when you're giving to God's kingdom, you can expect supernatural intervention. This thing, in the, the thinking of Christians is that when you walk up to a given an offering or in a basket or online, I don't know how people do it, but however they do it, the, the, the most carnal thing is it's just money and I might and I might not and I could and maybe I won't. But you don't understand that giving is literally how God connects supernatural intervention over your life. And, but it is the most nonsensical thing because you must be making the story up. No, listen to what Jesus said. Jesus says, give and you will receive. Now that's strange because people say, well, I don't give to get anything back. Why? Jesus even said, if you'll give, it'll come back to you. Oh, wait a minute. And your gift will return to you. Full measure. Press down. Shake it together. Run it over. That, I'm about to go. You better be glad I don't have a Hammond B3 organ. Press down. <laughs> Shake it together. We run it over. <laughs> Child of the Lord. <laughs> Give unto thee. <laughs> and the Lord, he's coming. <laughs> he's going to touch you, sister. <laughs> he's going to bless you from your head to your tip, right? <laughs> I had to stop. My hole was getting bigger. My breast was about to pop out. Preacher got so excited he lost his booby. Jesus, if you'll give, I'll return it to you. I will give it back to you. Now listen, I know this sounds strange. Remember, my head, my head is giving, says I've just lost something. I got $5. Should I give it or should I not? All right, I'm going to give it. Well, there you go. Oh, Jesus, help me. Like in my mind, I just lost something. Now, here's a thought. If you can change the way you think you didn't lose something, you planted a seed. If you've got a dollar bill, on every uh, currency in the American currency, there's a little tracking number on your dollar bill. It comes from the Federal Reserve to tell you where it was minted, how it was minted, where it came from, and a little signature down at the bottom from the Secretary of Treasury. We rarely think about it, but it's how they can track money. 
They can track that number. So the moment Mark gives his five, my, the little government I live in can track my little $5 bill through that number where it was minted, Denver, wherever it came out of. It can track it. But in God's kingdom, the moment I give my $5 bill, God says, I'm going to track that thing. The moment that seed goes in the ground, He says, if you'll give, there goes my five, and I go, there it goes. And God's like, no, 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 there it goes. The moment it left your hand, I got my angels trekking with it. And that five went there, and then that five went back there, and then that five went over here, and then all of a sudden God said, let's send it back to that old boy. And all of a sudden my $5 bill comes flying back, and it says it will return to you. You can expect it. And a matter of fact, just so you know that it's not all about my power, but about my wisdom, whatever amount you give is the amount you'll get back. Oh, that means if I'm chintzy, chintzy comes back, yes. If I give a nickel, a ni yep. If you give a spoon, a spoon, yep. A shovel, a shovel, yep. Mark, whatever you decide to give, son, it'll come back to you. Now that had to change in my thinking because my thinking is giving was I'm losing something. I'm, I'm losing my last piece of bread and my last oil and well, we're just going to die. But what I started learning years ago in my 30s is that giving was connected to God's supernatural intervention and I wasn't losing something, I was opening up the floodgates of heaven. And here's what's weird. There's no charge into what amount opens that. All he needs is a seed. That means a dollar can open up the windows of heaven and cause God to go, oh, you're trusting me now? Oh, you, you're trusting me. Is that what I just got out of that? Because now I'm about to show up and return it back. Now, we went to Alabama this week, my mother, my dad, and myself, and I drove them. And we were driving in, and we're talking about Alabama. It's our home state. And Dad and I are talking about, um, you know, we were at the church, and the church we went to, they do offering sermons. Anybody been to those churches? That's where you go. And somewhere in the middle, somebody stands up and goes, all right, it's time to give. And they do about a five-minute offering sermon. And they tell you to tithe and give, which is cool. Everybody does it, but you're welcome. We don't do that here. At least I had a gift of panic and I just didn't want to do that. I felt like I'd rather trust the Lord. So we basically say give. But at this church, they were doing the offering sermon and we were driving back home and dad and I were chatting about it. Mom's in the back seat and she's driving even though she's back there. And um, <laughs> hey, watch out. Oh, look, they're turning. Be careful. We got a red light up. Ahead. Watch out. They're breaking. They're breaking. They're breaking. Be careful. I'm like, my God, mother. I didn't say that. She's my mother. But in my spirit, my God, mother, I'm 58 years old. I can try. But I didn't say that. I said, yes, ma'am. <laughs> and so she's driving from the back seat. And I'm thinking it's a miracle my dad's still married to her. But I, I, I think this has nothing to do with my sermon. I think he doesn't even hear her. I think he's been married to her so long. It's just like, wee. And occasionally he'll tune in and go, oh, yeah, sure. Right. So we're, we're riding home, and, and he says, he said, I'm telling you, he said, you just can't ever outgive God. And I said, that's true, Dad. Thank you that you raised me to be a giver. He said, well, ever since 1963, I proved to God on a piece of paper as an accountant that you couldn't afford to give. But since 1963, I've given my whole life to God. I've never missed a tithe. I've always given to Him, and the Lord has blessed me. And I said back to that, thank you, Dad, because you've inspired me to be a giver as a son. I followed your footprints, and I tithe and give, and thank you so much. And he said, he, he was about to say, I said he said, but he was going to say it through mother. And so... <laughs> She uses a lot of his words. And so she said from the back seat, she, she inter interjected herself into the equation. And she said, you know, ever since your daddy has been a giver, he's never lacked a thing. He's never lacked one thing. And then dad, still trying to talk, said, he said, you know what? I just decided that as a young man, I would never chase money. I would chase God. And he said, and in chasing God, God has blessed me.
And then my mother said, you better believe he's blessed if people just knew where he came from. I'm telling you, he came from just nothing. He literally came from nothing. Just a shack. They didn't even have running water. They didn't have toilet. They had to pee outside. You had to go outside and get the water. And his daddy was an alcoholic. He only got an orange for Christmas. An orange. And you know when he was a kid, he would have to quit school and go pick cotton for a quarter a day. All day long. He didn't even have any shoes. He had no shoes. He had to get shoes out of a dumpster just to go play football. And me and dad are realizing we just lost the conversation. And mother's just preaching, just, ah, ah, ah. And, and then she sent me this. This is where my dad came from. His father was a sharecropper. He was poor. They had nothing. Over under the little outhouse shed in front of the car is where they got their water. They had no running water. They had to go to a, a well. Over to the left, you'll see another little barn with a piece of wood was their outhouse. You had to pee and poop outside. That was horrible because they dropped me off and said, you're staying with your grandparents. And I'm like, I don't want to stay there. And, and they said, I said, where do you go to the bathroom? Where do you shower? You don't shower. You just rinse off in a pail. Well, you got to poop and pee. And they're like, it's up the hill in the woods. Be careful. There are cotton mouths up there. And it's like, and I'll just tell you this. I don't care how spiritual you are. It's hard to poop thinking there could be a cotton mouth. It's like, oh, God, oh, gee. Out in the middle of the woods, there's flies and ticks and mosquitoes. And I'm like, my God, who could grow up this way? This is horrible. And he dropped me off there. We'll be back in a week to pick you up. I'm like, what if I'm dead? Like, I could die out here. And then at nighttime, my grandmother says, now, we don't go out to the outhouse at night to the bathroom because there's critters out there. And so I said, well, then what do we do? She said, well, we have a pea pot. I said, come again? She said, a pea pot. And she showed me the pea pot about this big. And she, she said, it will be in front of your door. And if you need to go, you just at night go to the pea pot. Well, I, I was like, well, that's interesting. And so I'm gifted at tinkling a lot. So, of course, I got to go to the bathroom at night. And so I get up and I can't see. It's dark. It's an old farmhouse. Does it look like there's electricity? No. So I'm kind of feeling around. I step over the 42 dogs with no teeth and hair because, because when you're broke, you don't have a full dog. They're missing legs. They're blind. They have one ear bitten off by a coyote. So I'm stepping over all the poor animal, farm animal. I'm a little kid. I'm 10 years old. I pull my little britches down, and I start to go in the pea pot. But, but I don't hear the... I, just, I'm, I'm, I know I'm tinkling, but I, I'm like... And then all of a sudden, I move my head, click, click, click. I'm like, oh, there it is. Click, 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 And I'm like, I found the pea pot. That's what my dad came from. He came out of nothing. And he's 87 years old. And his own testimony is, I'm where I'm at today because I decided to take God at his word and be a giver. And I gave myself out of poverty. I, his own words, I gave myself out of poverty. I, don't, I can't even fathom that in my natural thinking. Why? Because giving is to lose something. But in his mind, he grabbed a hold. No, giving is a return. Giving is a seed. Giving is loosing the intervention of God. Giving is supernatural. Giving opens up the windows of heaven. Giving causes God to lavish it back to me. And I think I'm just going to chase God and let God handle the resources. And though my father wasn't a widow, and my father wasn't a widow, his own testimony is, you know what he got for Christmas? An orange. He didn't grow up eating meat. They couldn't afford meat. He had one cow and he would walk it every day from the barn to the pasture. He came home one day and his father killed the cow for meat. My dad said, I didn't eat meat for a year. I couldn't eat my own cow. He was my pet. I was like, yeah, you should eat the dogs. They're all missing stuff anyway. <laughs> his father was an alcoholic. He could have easily become a victim. He could have chased after the world. He was an accountant. He understood money. He could have worked the natural system and made his investments in his retirement. So I'm not against that. That's good things to do. 
But he made a decision in 1963 before many of us were even born. And he said, I shall take God at His word and I shall be a giver. And from that moment, he took God like that widow that I don't understand it. I can't explain it. But I'm going to do it. I end with this scripture that may explain it better. 2 Corinthians 9. Remember this, a farmer who plants a few seeds gets a small crop, but one who plants generously gets a generous crop. In other words, what I need you to start thinking is, rather than thinking money and I'm losing it, think seed. And all you need to do is plant it. And if you plant it, Oh, get out of this, you better. All right, somebody in the room, give me a thousand. Who's got a thousand? I know the Lord's speaking right now. Church is hurting for money. What I need right now is a thousand dollars. God's going to heal your children. Give me a thousand. See, right up there. Come on, somebody give me a thousand. Right, That's the way we do it. God says, look, all I need is a seed. What would happen if every believer started just going, I'm just going to bring a seed? I'm just bringing my seed. Because once everybody starts bringing a seed, supernatural things start happening in your life. Deborah came up to me right before church. She said, can I tell you something? She didn't know I was preaching on giving. She came second service. I said, sure, share it with me. We were sitting right there. She's sitting right there. She said, last week I had no money. And I was on a walk. And on my walk, I looked down and I saw a $20 bill. And she said, I grabbed that $20 bill. And I thought, well, this is going to come handy to help me pay some bills. And she said, I was coming to church. And she said, the Lord told me that it was a seed and I need to give it as an offering. Now, the seed she found wasn't even her own seed. She found it on the ground. She grabbed it like this could help me, $20. And she said, not a preacher. We don't even you know, take up offerings here. You just do it out of the generosity. She said, I'm going to give it at church. So she came to church. She gave it. Do you know what she said? She said a person came to her house and gave her ten times the amount. The next day, God told me I was to help you. She gave a 20, got back 200. You can call that luck. You can call it fate. I call it a woman who had a seed and let it go and it connected her to the supernatural intervention of God. Another lady, first service, came up. She said, it's amazing. I said, what? She said, I'm just telling you, it is amazing. She said, I have not gotten a bonus at work in years and I just do. I'm going to give. And she said, I just decided to give last week and I just went and gave. I didn't really have it, but I gave. She said, I went to work the next day and do you know what happened? I said, well, I can only imagine, but tell me. She said, I went to work and they gave every employee $200 gift cards of a Visa card. I got two of them. I was already thinking, how am I going to repair my car? How am I going to fix this? She said, I just gave a little seed in the offering that could have done nothing. And she said, and I go to work the next day and all of a sudden $400? And I can fix my car now? I'm like, well, that's true. That's that supernatural intervention of God. You can't explain it mathematically. You can't explain it in the head. It's God trying to connect us humans who chase the world to stop chasing the world, plant the seed, and watch what God will do. He will blow your mind. Another gentleman last week was texting me and he said, Pastor, I got to tell you something. I said, what? He said, God's been speaking to me that I need to give more. And he said, things are tight. I'm stressed. And he said, but I know when I get stressed, I just got to give. So he said, I just wanted you to know that I just decided to give more. He said, I logged into my account and I added the extra in. All right, God, I'm going to do this. He gave it. Two hours later, gets an e- two hours, gets an email back from a business that says, hey, we would like to do business with you now that he had been hoping for. And now that door's opened up and the resources start coming. Is that just luck? Most Christians have more faith in Vegas and Mega Million Powerball than they do God. Preacher, I ain't got no seed to give today. Oh, come on. You were at QT giving them $22, hoping you're going to win $935 million. You're not going to win $935 million because you can't even handle a dollar. You think God's going to give you 900 Oh, if He would. 
I'd pay off that church. You, you, I'm telling you, preacher, you let God give me $935 million, you nor Miss Robin or your church will ever lack a thing. And God's like, honey, you're lying. You, you won't even give me 50 cents. You see, it's the mind. It's the mind. We, we play natural games with supernatural thinking. I'll end right here. Verse 7. Now here, this is your part. You, me, need to decide in your heart how much you want to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. And gosh, I've been there. Church really needs you. We're going under. We can't make it without you. Well, somebody here just please give. No, don't, don't worry about pressure. But what God is expecting is, have you made a decision? Have you decided in your heart when you come to the house of God, have you decided when you walk in, are you going to give? Well, I don't really have anything. Yes, you do. Everybody in the room, no matter what level of life we are, we all have a seed. Even in Kenya, where Phil goes, we're not even talking money. You've got to quit thinking money. Think seed. Everybody has something to give. Everybody. Even the woman that said, I have nothing. And she said, all of a sudden, I felt convicted and realized, no, I do. She said, I went out to my car. I looked under my seat. There was a quarter. I brought the quarter. I gave it to God. Everybody has something. It's just that we're bought into the world system. So decide in your heart, how much do you want to give? Oh, and by the way, God says, I just like when you do it cheerfully. Put a smile on your face. So I'm looking at that five. And oh, in my 20s, I wasn't cheerful. I was like, oh, Jesus, it's $5. You can do a lot with $5 in 1980. And then you give it. And as you watch it go off, you just it's kind of like the Titanic. I love you, Jack. I love you. Because when you're broke and you give from a broke mentality, you're losing something. But when you use God's mind and you let it go rather than waving goodbye to your last five so you can go home and die, you, you do it cheerfully. So now that five dollars. <laughs> Cheerful. <laughs> you don't own me. <laughs> you think I serve you? <laughs> Here we go. And I throw my five. And then rather than bemoaning it, I just start going... You got to keep on casting your bread up on the water. Soon it's going to come back home on every way. Like literally. Like just, but I didn't get here at 58. I've been working on it since I was 15. I was told as a 15-year-old at my first job, son, be a giver. I did it because my dad wanted me to because I lived in his house. In my 20s, I did it because I was kind of afraid and you should do it. In my 30s, I couldn't understand it because I had kids and I might go broke. In my 40s, I decided, dear God, I'm halfway through life. I might as well just get on God's train here. And it took me to about age 40 to realize you cannot ever, ever outgive God. You cannot ever outgive God. And I made a decision, I will never show up with God again without a seed in my hand. Bow your heads and close your eyes. I don't know your financial situation. You may be a prophet that has nothing. You may be a widow with very little. You may be thinking, I'm going to lose my car tomorrow. You may be thinking, I'm saving up for a house. You may be thinking, my God, have you seen my credit card bills? You may be thinking, I genuinely, Mark, have nothing. I have nothing to give. Oh, yes, just start, go on a walk. You say, I'm broke, I have nothing. Just go on a walk and watch that little $20 bill find you. God will find you. He'll bring resources to you. He'll give seed to the sower. All you have to do is say, God, I'm willing to sow. I'm willing to give. If you bring it, I will give it. And what's going to happen? Honey, I'm not just trying to be a preacher. I'm not, I'm not reluctantly trying to get you to buy into some scam. I want you to live a life of abundance. 
of resources from God. Resources where the heavens open up. Resources where God opens your life up. And you may feel like, I'm just telling you, I'm going under. I have so many medical bills to pay. I've got so much on my plate. I can't afford this. I'm just telling you over and over and over, the testimonies abound of widows who said, let me test God. Let me trust the Lord. A businessman that said, I've proven it doesn't work, but let me trust Him anyway. Of people that said, I was about to lose my house, but I decided to trust Him anyway. Of somebody said they were going to impound my car, but I decided to trust Him anyway. And I started bringing seed to His house. I started becoming a giver. I quit thinking in poverty. I quit being a victim of my life. I quit looking at my checkbook like I was losing something. And I started seeing it as I'm giving. I don't know who this is for. You can test it. I'm good with that. I feel like there's somebody here, you've just been really stressed over business lately. You own a business or run a business. I don't know, but but it's like I see a stress that is just weighing heavy. And, and, And you're like, the best way I can see it, like I think any business person would do this, moving things around and shifting things and trying to make sense of all the equations and the money in versus money out and the everything that's involved, I'm fine with that. That's what business people do. But I feel to encourage you, if you're here and that's you, today make a decision. God has given me this business and out of it I'm going to begin to plant seed. And God is going to expound that business. And God is going to flood your business. And your testimony is going to, I don't know, but write it down and let's see if it comes to pass. But I feel this in my heart. Your testimony was going to be, God's going to teach you how to do business His way. And people are going to say, how did you get so successful? How did you go from point A to point B to point Z? How did you get this way? Tell me your secret. And you're going to laugh. You're going to say, well, you probably won't believe me, but I decided to do business God's way. And He opened up the doors. He gave me favor when I didn't deserve favor. He gave me clients when I didn't even know where to find them. He sent me business when the economy was hurting. Some of you right now are believing for a job. You're believing that God's going to make a way. Well, I understand that's how that would have felt. I kind of feel hopeless. I need God to come through for me. Maybe you're staring down some tragedy right now. You're looking at something going, man, I hope we can get through this. I hope I can make my way through this. Today, when you come up to these communion tables, bring a seed with you. Bring a seed with you. Bring us in. And don't, don't talk yourself into you got to have some huge amount of money. No, just a seed, a dollar, a quarter, a seed. And when you walk up there, you say, God, this is my seed. And then whatever that need is, God, this is the seed. That widow was, we're dying. That widow was, there's a death sentence. I don't know who that's for. But it's like there's been a death sentence pronounced over you. A death sentence. Nothing is going to change no matter what you do. I think even in your mind, you've heard, just go ahead and prepare yourself. Prepare yourself. Get ready to die. Get your affairs in order. That's what that widow was doing. No, I, I felt to encourage you. When you come to communion today, bring a seed. And when you put that seed in, you put it in with, oh, everything's about to change. Everything is about to change. What was a death sentence is going to be a life sentence. What was lack is going to be more than enough. What was, I don't know if I'm going to get out of this hole, is going to be a stream of hope that is just going to flood you. What is it that you need? The Lord wants to connect His people up to His supernatural intervention. We are the children of the Lord God Almighty. We have to stop thinking like worldly people. We have to quit trying to figure Him out in our own mind. I will say this, if He can speak to a widow, and Jesus can say give, and Paul can say God gives seed, and we do, we have testimony after testimony of humans that have done it, and it works. Listen to me, every young person in this room. I'm saying young, 25 and under. The best advice I could give you beyond being saved and filled with His Spirit is at your age, become a giver. Do what my father did, chase the kingdom rather than money. Rather than seeing all the money that comes in is just amassing more stuff with you, that's great. It's good to have whatever you want to work hard for. But... Chase God and watch what He'll do with the money. 
Don't sell young people. Don't sell your soul to this world system. You'll lose your marriage over it. You'll lose your sanity over it. Your kids will grow up. You're trying to make money and your kids will grow up. You'll miss them because you're trying to earn that dollar. Yes, work hard, but trust the Lord. Trust Him. I don't know who this is for. I'm not trying to belabor you. I'm not trying to keep you longer. But I would be very remiss to just end when I feel these in my heart. Somebody's here, you're in deep fear. You've been struggling with a deep fear, not normal. It, it is an almost an abnormal fear. Whew. <laughs> Bring a seed and plant a seed that that fear leaves you. Your kids won't die. You won't, I don't know what the fear is, but it's just tormenting you. It won't leave you. There's a girl. I don't know how old you are, sweetheart. Really frustrated. You're really frustrated. Almost to the point that you, you would say, I hate myself. I don't I see you looking in the mirror and you're just like you you hate yourself. You you judge yourself. You don't like the way you look. You 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 just the, the words you feel of yourself, if you if you even let people know, they would be shocked that you felt that way. But internally, you do. You, you, you loathe. Would you bring a seed today? And when you put it in, just go, God, teach me to love myself like you see me. Teach me to see myself. Break me free from the lies in my mind. Oh, believers, church, as a shepherd of the house, if I could say one thing to you. We have to quit coming and just tossing money and just drinking communion and singing like it's just some religious duty. It's supernatural. God's trying to connect up with you. God's trying to connect up with you. The one thing that is the idol of America is money. And yet God's trying to connect up with you through it. Like, trust me, trust me, trust me. I know you got bills, son. I know you got car payments, Mark. I know you got this. I know you got college. I know you got all this stuff, son. Trust me. Give to me and watch what I do. Stand up with me, if you will. Now, from my shepherd heart to you, I want to say this to everybody in the room. If you're new, you know, I hope you hear my heart. We don't stand up here every week and talk about money and offerings. But I want this message to resonate so deep in your heart. Maybe go listen to it again. Maybe pray over it. Maybe take it home with you when it comes out on all the platforms. But every single week, we're going to end, as we always do with communion. I'm going to talk about that next week. But... We end with communion, and behind that communion are these little baskets on the doors as you go out, these boxes. Some of us give off of our phone. But what I'm asking of you as, as people who come here is every time we come, just bring a seat. Purpose in your heart, if I'm going in the door, I'm going with a seat. If I'm going in the door, and if you start hearing, I don't have a seat, start praying, God, show me where it's at. Show me where it's at. And what I'm praying is what that lady told me Wednesday night because I told him, I said, I'm praying that God begin to bless our church above and beyond in favor, in resources. And I've been praying that for a while. And she came up, she said, man, your prayers are working. So right where you are, bow your head. Father, I know in this culture we live in, times are tight. Bills abound. Groceries are really expensive. Gas is going up. And then, Lord God, not to mention all the fees. Fees here, fees there. Fees here, sell this. Go fund me this. Sell that for your kids. God, we live in a culture that's riddled with give me, give me, give me. And yet we're in a kingdom where you say, well, give me and watch what I do. So today, Father, everybody in this house that calls this place home, 
I thank you that you give us the faith to purpose in our heart and decide in our heart what we're going to do. But what we choose to do is make a decision that we as a body of Christ will all be givers. All of us always have a seed. Today I bless every seed that is being given, whether it's in the boxes or the baskets or online. I declare every seed given will have supernatural impact and that you will abound it back to every father, every mother, every child, every business owner, every widow, every divorced person, every single mom, every single person, every college student, that we will look back and say, hey, I started giving. Let me tell you what God has done. I bless you. I bless you as you come. I bless the communion. Here's what I would ask as you come and partake communion. Let's honor what it is. It's us connecting up with God's covenant. Do your giving. Go back. Spend a moment with with God in your communion. Let's worship with Michael. Robin will come at the end and dismiss us. I love you and bless you. If you need prayer, feel free to come up. You may come now for communion and giving.